Welcome to Financial Insider Weekly. I'm your host, Michael Gray, CPA. My guest today is Naomi Comfort. Hi, Mike. Hi. <laughs> Naomi is an attorney with Hawks and Comfort LLP. Uh, Naomi has taught continuing education courses on fiduciary income taxation and other subjects to CPAs, attorneys, and the public, including doing some uh, classes together with me. And um, let's see, you got your uh, JD at Golden Gate University? Correct. Yes. And anyway, so uh, Naomi's a very good attorney, very good speaker, and I'm really pleased to have her as a guest with me here today. Today, Naomi and I are going to be talking about special needs trusts. Now, I'm, I'm doing this because there's uh, a lot of buzz about it. You, know, you may have seen some things in the newspaper and so forth, and you're saying, well, what is this? And so we're going to try to get a little bit into it today. But this is just an introduction, only a few highlights. Uh, so we want to caution you, see your own attorney, uh, get legal advice if you have to do something like this. Uh, but this is intended to be a, sort of a, a start for a continuing conversation. And uh, also, uh, Naomi is a California attorney. I'm a California CPA. Uh, so you may have other rules that may apply in your state. And so just be aware of that as well. And with that, let's get into it. Okay, Naomi, what the heck is a special needs trust? What the heck? <laughs> well, a, okay. special, a special needs trust <laughs> is a type of trust that can be set up to protect assets for somebody who is disabled or unable to manage those assets. And that could be somebody who's physically disabled and has full capacity, understands mm -hmm. everything that's going on. Uh, or it could be for somebody who has a, a mental incapacity, whether that be uh, cognitive problems, whether that be uh, post uh, accident, um, whether that be mental illness, it could be any of those. There are really two types of special needs trusts that I want to point out to start with. There is what's called a third party special needs trust, where somebody else, a parent usually, or a grandparent, takes their own assets and sets them up in this trust to benefit the disabled person. Mm -hmm. That's a third party trust. The assets that are in that trust never belonged to the disabled person. Okay. A first party special needs trust is where the assets are actually the disabled person's own assets that have been put into a special needs trust and those are typically set up to allow somebody to continue to qualify for needs-based public benefits even though they have come into money from maybe an inheritance or from um, the result of litigation. Maybe there has been an accident or an injury mm -hmm. and as part of the settlement of that lawsuit there's a hunk of money that's going to be set aside for them and instead of it going outright to the injured beneficiary it goes into this special needs trust so those assets actually belonged to the injured person or the disabled person and are transferred into the special needs trust. That's a first party trust. The two different trusts have different sets of rules um, that apply to them. And that's why I pointed out to begin with, that we could have our whole conversation just about third party trust, which is where parents and grandparents and other people set up uh, the trust for the disabled person. But there's a whole other set of trusts which are actually much more complicated and have many, many, many different levels of rules that we have to apply to them where we can protect assets for, that actually belong to the beneficiary. So we have those two sets of situations that we run into. Okay, good. Well, thank you for that. All right. So what are some of the needs-based benefits that special needs trusts are designed to qualify for? So when somebody is disabled and they're uh, receiving money from the government. That could be in the form of SSDI, which is disability income, and that is a guaranteed payment. That has nothing to do with the assets you actually have. SSDI is disability income for somebody who has a work history, 
who then becomes disabled. That's like a social so, security. So SSDI is not based on being needy, it's based on your work history. Okay. So SSDI you can get even if you have assets and Medicare when you have reached the age of 65 you get even if you have assets. Your social security payments that you receive at 65 or maybe earlier or maybe later um, are based on what you've put into the system. They're not based on how poor or destitute you are. However, the Medi-Cal program is going to be needs-based. So if somebody needs health insurance or needs medical services through Medi-Cal, they have to show, demonstrate to the government that they're not able to pay for them themselves. So that's the biggest thing that we're utilizing is, is Medi-Cal. But there's also HUD, your uh, subsidized housing, that somebody has to keep their income and their assets below a certain level in order to qualify for that. And when we're talking about these programs, you know, for my disabled uh, individuals, it's not just, you know, it's not just being able to pay the doctor's bill. Once you're in these systems, you have a whole network of services that are being provided. You maybe are living in subsidized housing, have a day program that you go to, have social workers, and just a, just a whole array of services that are all tied into this program. And if your services are interrupted because you have all of a sudden received a bunch of assets, it's not just, oh no, I'm gonna have to pay the doctor out of pocket. It's, I don't qualify for this program anymore that used to fill my day with activities. I lose my social network that was connected with that, as well as my professional network that was attached with that. So it can be very devastating for these disabled individuals to actually lose their their public benefits coverage. It's it's not just about, you know, oh we need more money in our pockets. It's mm -hmm. it's really about providing a a safe and enhanced living environment for them. So what these trusts can do is they take the third party assets, the parents or the grandparents, or the first party assets, and we take those assets and we put them inside the trust and they suddenly become what's called a non-countable asset. They're not considered to be owned by the disabled person. And therefore, the disabled person, when they fill out the applications for these different programs, says, you know, they say what their assets are. It doesn't include these assets over here that are in the special needs trust. It's just their household furniture and furnishings, their clothing, and maybe up to $2,000 in their personal checking account, something like that. So what we're doing is we're creating a place to hold these assets to safeguard them so that we can pay out of that trust for things that are not covered by public benefits, for things that are above and beyond what that impoverished person uh, is going to have under the public benefit system. What it really allows us to do is maintain a more humane um, quality of life for the disabled persons. Um, and that's what the families are setting out to do. They want to make sure there's extra money to pay for dental care, for glasses, for uh, companions to go on a needed vacation or travel uh, to see family. There's lots and lots of things we can do with the assets that are set aside in these trusts to make the beneficiary's life a much better place. Okay.